G'day, Chris here and welcome back to Clickspring. So in the previous episode, I covered the process of forming cutters that give a good approximation of the involute gear profile. And without much modification, the same tools and approach can be used to generate cutters to form the so-called cycloidal profile. One of the key differences between the two systems is that the cycloidal profile has these straight, apparently radial flanks to the tooth profile. And I say apparently because while for pinions they are indeed radial, for the larger gears, otherwise known in horology as wheels, we make use of a helpful simplification of the standard. For ease of use and manufacture, modern cutters are based on the specific mesh of a 45 tooth wheel and a 6 leaf pinion. And the constants provided by the standard are determined for that specific combination, regardless of what the actual gear tooth counts happen to be. Now this means that the geometry is only ever truly correct for that specific combination but it turns out from a mechanical perspective to not matter enough to cause a problem. And the payoff is that it allows us to further simplify the geometry of the wheel cutter profile by permitting a fixed flank angle of 2 degrees and a single cutter that spans the entire range of teeth from 16 up to a rack. Now of course a flank angle of any kind means that we have to change our approach with the button cutters. This time we have to bring a single button cutter in on an angle, usually after having taken a few extra cuts to prepare the blanks. Generally speaking, thinning the blank down to the optimum cutter thickness before getting started on the profile geometry is a good idea anyway, if only to reduce the amount of material that you have to deal with when sharpening the cutter. Although it's something you can easily skip without consequence for the envelope cutters if you'd prefer to save time and just get on with it. But for the cycloidal cutters, it's generally a must to keep things convenient when taking the angled cuts and to ensure correct formation of the curved section of the cutters. And taking a final very fine cut on each side without disturbing the cutter position is a convenient way to ensure the reduction of the blank thickness has been conducted symmetrically. Ok, so for the first cycloidal cutter we're going to make a 0.85 module square bottom profile wheel cutter and use it to cut a 45 tooth wheel. The calculator gives us all of the data that we need to do the job, starting with the button diameter. And while we're here, we can also retrieve the button diameter data for the pinion we're going to cut in a moment too. Much the same as for the involute cutters, the process starts by making a circular cutter that will form the required addendum curve. Now of course, we can simply make a button cutter as per the previous videos, but there's also the option of forming the curve directly into a high speed steel cutting tool instead, with the payoff being that we get a much more robust cutter to work with, and so can be a little more relaxed when using it. It requires nothing more than a simple guide, formed by drilling a hole in some scrap and then opening up one side of the hole so that it can be used to check the grind of the tool. It does require a bit of care and time to get a truly circular profile, but it's an excellent alternative method, particularly for forming larger module horological cutters, where the profile can be more easily achieved by eye. Once complete, the tool must be presented to the work something like this, and then carefully fed in on a specific angle. For a wheel, we know from the calculator that the angle must be 2 degrees, so the top slide is set to a precise 2 degree angle, and a dial indicator is mounted on the lathe to read the carriage travel. And don't be concerned if the blank is slightly oversized after thinning towards the optimum width. The calculator can still be used to give the required carriage travel from touch off. Simply enter in the actual width and then be sure to use the side of the cut section for touch off. The cutter is then zeroed to the work, using only the cross slide and carriage for travel. 
and then with its collar also zeroed. The top slide is wound out and then back in slightly to take up the backlash. Coming to rest just short of zero, ready for the first cut. Everything is now set up for the cut to proceed, using the carriage travel and top slide infeed data provided by the calculator. Importantly, the cross slide will not be touched again and should remain in the same position for the rest of the operation. All movement of the tool is made with the carriage and the top slide. In this case, the total required travel of the carriage up to the position for the final cut is 1.45 millimetres, and I chose to break this down into three passes. For the first cut, I moved the carriage along one millimetre, and then fed in the full 3.08 millimetre top slide figure as read from the calculator. The tool was then withdrawn and the carriage moved along by 0.3 millimetres to take the second cut, again feeding in with the top slide. For the final cut, the carriage was moved along the remaining 0.15mm to give the total 1.45mm distance from the side touch-off position and then locked. And you can see that keeping this last move small means that the final cut is shallow, giving the best shot at a good surface finish. With this first half profile complete, the work was removed and the cutter arbor given a bit of a brush to remove any chips that might throw off the seating. The cutting tool was again withdrawn using the top slide and the carriage returned to the zero position, being careful to take up the backlash on both. With everything now back in the initial zero state, the work can be returned to the cutter arbor, indexed to another position and the process repeated. Once all four of the cuts are complete on one side, the work is simply flipped over to profile the other side in exactly the same way. The gear cutter profile is now fully formed in each of the four lobes of the workpiece and can be revealed by milling away material in front of the sections that will become each tooth. Again, as for the involute cutters, the cutter arbor serves as a convenient fixture to both hold and index the cutter blanks on the mill, making this part of the process very straightforward. And once the teeth have been revealed, heat treating follows, with the standard quench hardening and tempering process. The sharpening tool brings up the cutting edge and that's the cutter ready for use. As for the involute cutters, the outside diameter of the wheel can be retrieved from the calculator to permit preparation of the wheel blank. One interesting thing about horological cutters is that the nature of the profile requires that the cutter top the tooth when cutting, 
So rather than being provided with a strict in-feed figure like the envelope cutters, it's common practice to determine full depth of cut by taking trial cuts either side of a single tooth until the outside diameter marking is just barely detectable, or if you prefer, as it just disappears. Once this full depth of cut is determined, the cutter spindle is locked off and then the cut can proceed around the entire wheel. Now ordinarily, a horological wheel cutter would be used almost exclusively on brass, as it has been here. And if treated well, could be expected to have a service life quite comparable to that of a commercial cutter. So this really is an excellent way to get started cutting clock and watch wheels, and to reduce one of the larger costs of a horological project. But if you're investigating this home shop cutter process with a view to making the whole mechanism with shop made cutters, then what you really need to know is how well do these cutters perform when cutting steel pinions? Because pinion cutting is one of the most difficult operations to conduct successfully in the home shop. We're asking an awful lot of even a commercial cutter, let alone a shop made cutter, when hogging out steel to form delicate pinion leaves. The cutting forces are high, chip removal is less than ideal, and the nature of the job leads to a lot of unavoidable compromise in the work holding. But having said all of that, you'll be pleased to see that these home shop cutters are more than up to the job, and in one key respect, may even perform a little better than the commercial cutters. Data retrieval and setup is essentially the same as for the wheel cutters, and in this case I'm forming a 0.85 module 10 leaf pinion. Again circles apply for the addenda, and from our perspective the main observable difference to the wheel profile is that the pinion flanks are truly radial so we should expect the flank angle to change with the number of pinion leaves. The cutter formation proceeds as you would now expect, all of the way through to the end of the heat treating stage. Again, the blank outside dimension data can be read directly from the calculator and the work prepared for milling the teeth. In this case, I'm cutting EN8, medium carbon steel. It's a pleasant to machine, quench hardenable steel, well suited to forming into clock pinions. And as you can see, the cutter does exactly what we needed to do. Again, as for the envelope cutters working in steel, a word of caution. Pinion cutters, whether shop made or commercial high speed steel, need to be treated gently. So a modest RPM and modest feed rates are the order of the day. But one very helpful plus of the home shop version is a byproduct of the cutters having far fewer teeth. 
When chips don't readily exit the cut, they tend to stick to the cutter and then travel around to impact the work on the next pass, bruising the surface. And in a worst case, they can even chip the cutter. But with fewer teeth, and certainly when using compressed air to clear the chips, I've found the shop made cutters have a much lower tendency to hold onto the chips, and so this issue is pretty much solved. And just to take the exercise through to completion, here's the same cutter working its way through a less pleasant material, O1 tool steel. It's a much harder material to work, and if you have access to a more machinable high carbon steel, then it's probably not the optimum choice for horological pinions anyway. But there may be occasions when it's all that you can get your hands on. So it's worth knowing that the shop made cutters are up to the job. Now of course, a harder material will take more of a toll on the cutter, in which case it's likely that you'll want to sharpen the cutter mid-task. And this highlights the value of the sharpening tool made in part one. Simply remove the cutter without disturbing either the work or the cutting spindle. Give each cutter face a quick hone, and then when you're happy that the cutter is back in good condition, return it to the spindle and continue on with the job. Naturally, of course, just as for the involute system, the tools will generate cycloidal fly cutters. The same angles, button diameters and so on apply, all retrieved from the calculator to give a single tooth fly cutter that will do a superb job in the right circumstances. And before I wrap up this episode, Keep in mind the value of running through all of these processes on a soft, forgiving material like brass, before committing the actual workpiece. It's a great way to trial all of the steps, discover the unknowns unique to your particular setup, and determine beyond any doubt the fiddly things like centering of the cutter and so on. So that when it counts, there's a much higher probability of success. As a general rule, I take this approach for any process where it's a little unfamiliar or something I might otherwise know well but haven't performed for some time. It costs me a little bit of scrap and a little bit of time, but it's a whole lot more fun to discover the problems in a process when they simply don't matter. So there you have it. Cycloidal gear cutters for making quite presentable horological wheels and pinions in the home shop and at a fraction of the cost of the commercial alternatives. In the next and final part of this home shop gear cutter series, I'll cover off how to include fillet geometry into both involute and cycloidal cutters, as well as investigate some of the edge cases of each system. Thanks for watching. I'll see you later.